Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Elwood, joined by my very special guest, Ron Placone. Ron, how you doing? What up, everybody? Hey, Graham. Good to see you. <laughs> so we did seven weeks in a row of these Saturday night Zoom shows, the first like two months of the of the quarantine, which were really fun. And the last time we did one, about three weeks ago, uh, on Sunday, May 31st, like that full week of protests and where, you know, the cops completely overreacted and it was all this, you know, that day I was myself was earlier at a protest in Santa Monica that went off the rails and there was looting and everything. That's right. Yeah. I forgot. Like we did it on a Sunday because we like had to push it back a day. Yeah. Yeah. Because everything was up for grabs that week. And mm -hmm. we, there's this, you know, we've done this character. Or I've done this character where I call in as Nancy Pelosi and we put, I put a picture up of her and I, you know, make fun of how out of touch she is and, you know, she's eating ice cream and you play a great straight man. <laughs> so you're yeah, I'm, I, I pretend as if, you know, like it's all improvised and I'm actually talking to Nancy Pelosi and mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, we're, we're giving you a peek under the hood because it's pertinent to what we're about to share with you. And I riffed that I didn't know. I like forgot who George Floyd was I at in yeah. character as Nancy Pelosi. And yeah, I was like, do you even know what this is all about? And I was do, like, do you know the guy's <laughs> name? And, and she was like, Ron, I Ron, all lives matter. And we're going to do <laughs> something, you know, and I just I said, Ron and and you were you legitimately got mad like it was I would give you credit. It was like amazing. I kept acting. Up this, yeah, no, I kept <laughs> up the sketch. I'm just like you were like that's <laughs> you were like Speaker Pelosi. Are you serious? This you know, <laughs> and and I remember uh, we we got off. I got after the, the the whole show was done. I remember I called you and we talked about stuff and I said, man, I felt I felt like maybe that was too insensitive that Pelo my, me playing Pelosi's character would have forgotten. I was like, God, I hope, you know, like it was so, tensions are still very high in America for obvious reasons. And a lot of it's good, like change is happening. But I felt like, oh God. I remember talking to you on the phone, like, I, don't, I mean, maybe I went too far with the character saying she for, forgot who he was. And I don't want people to think, oh, these two white guy comedians are being insensitive to George Floyd. Or I was like, I felt really bad about it. Because it seemed too far fetched that she would actually do that. <laughs> nope. Turns out, um, I predicted it unknowingly. <laughs> Here's what just happened. Uh, to the Congressional Black Caucus who have shaped the bill, but I only will do that if you tell me that this legislation is worthy of George Kirby's name. Oh, and he said it is, and so we're oh, very proud. Wow. We're very proud to carry that. Who do you oh, believe wow. when it comes to civil rights Here's Chuck Schumer. and police accountability? Mitch McConnell or the lawyer for the families of Floyd Taylor, or George Taylor, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor? So, <laughs> I, I mean, and yeah, and, and guess what? We weren't, you know, it's like, uh, they are that out of touch. Yeah. And it wasn't a hyperbolized sketch. They are that out of touch. They are that out of touch. And and the, the in general, the argument can be made. People like you and I do it on our shows all the time. We, we, we you know, we, we, we you're, you're trying to remember all these names. But come on, man. <laughs> George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, like that's you. And if you're as politicians who claim to be on the resistance and this is how out of touch they are. But these are the same people who have basically said, well, wait a minute, we don't want to defund the police. Let's, they're still talking all this old out of date reform the police. No, we can't, it's too late. We've tried reform. It doesn't work. Like that's. Yeah, you can't reform this. No. I mean, and, and we've talked about that. I mean, I've talked about it on my show. I've talked about it here. I, I mean, we've all, this is not something that, that can be reformed because it is a systemic disease that goes back decades and decades and decades. And we're finding out more and more. I mean, I think we're gonna learn it's even worse than we realize as far as actual white supremacists and neo-Nazis in positions of power. Mm -hmm. I think it's worse than we even realize. Well, honestly, like you have to, 
I mean, the laws that were set up, you know, by the the found the framers, you know, were very much in favor. They were all slave owners and very much in favor of keeping landowners and powerful white people and powerful white men specifically in charge and power. And the Thirteenth Amendment, you know, that documentary is very powerful, and that that shows how like how systemic for centuries this has been. But even specific to the like white nationalists. And Nazis, if you go back to Operation Paperclip, where we scooped up all these Nazis after World War II and brought them to this country, and oh, it's always been, you know, it's kind of known, but oh, it was just because we needed their scientists. Well, they weren't just like, oh, we're just science nerds who just did what Hitler told it. Like, they were card-carrying Nazis. They were, and part of the Nazi party was like the occult. And I, mean, I don't want to get, like, too tinfoil hatty here, but I'm sorry, you can't have this systemic evil and racism without this being in place for a long time. And like, look, the that second week of the protest when all of a sudden six black men all were lynched and it was claimed, oh, they all committed suicide and nooses started showing up, that was coordinated. And I'm not... I, I, there's obviously plenty of white nationals and evil Nazis that are capable of doing that, but that's like coordinated by someone in power in positions of like, this is a coordinated attempt. And when you see like, uh, I think that's part of it. Like you say is we're really uncovering like chiefs of police mayors. Oh yeah. I, I mean, all of it. Well, it happened a long time ago. I mean, even going like a little more recent where, you know, David Duke and, uh -huh. and people like that decided we're going to put the suits on and we're going to yes. we're not going to shave our heads. We're going to have the, the regular nice hairdos and we're going to infiltrate various institutions. And one of those institutions, of course, is the police force. And that's pretty easy to infiltrate because guess what? They're not really doing much of a background check on you. If you're a member of the KKK, they're probably not going to find out. Worse yet, there's a good chance they're not going to care because systemic racism is built into the organization you're infiltrating. So, and, and, you know, I, I think it goes pretty deep, man. And, and Ferguson, you know, when Anonymous did that dump back during the Ferguson days, they showed us, like, just how many actual KKK members are carrying badges and guns yep. and nothing happened. Nothing, nothing changed. Nothing changed. I mean, look, I've had uh, backyard politics on this show, and she's showing me footage, and we've seen it come out of just Salem, Oregon, of them protecting the Proud Boys and white nationalists. And she, you know, posts a photo on her Instagram of a guy with a Nazi flag in his pickup, proudly back of his, you know, proudly displayed in the back of his pickup, and so. And look, they get into power, and this the chief of police is is a white nationalist. Well, they're he's going to make sure that the next his his you know his the person who takes his place is going to be one, and they're going to make sure there's key people in power. And okay, maybe they'll hire a couple of black officers just for the 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 window dressing of 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 of, of, of uh, pro, you know of uh, progress, you know. But the power structure. I mean, look, if you watch The Watchmen on HBO, that was like the, one of the storylines is that this Klan organization is secretly in power in, in the police departments. And you can't, you, can't, you can't deny that anymore. It can't seem like, well, maybe I'm some, old, some, sure, some sheriff's department in Mississippi or something. No, man. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no. It's, it's the whole country. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and and people can't just keep turning a blind eye to that. And that's why, you know, when people, oh, defund, that's just too, that's too harsh. That's just too, I mean, come on. And it's like, look, I get it that it's really hard to wrap your head around the idea that a, a systemic structure that we have known for years and years and years needs to completely go away. Mm -hmm. And something new needs to take it take its place i realize that that's not an easy concept to wrap one's head around but think about it this way if we just reinvent what it means to have law and order in our lives mm -hmm. and come up with an entirely different system 
what are the chances it would be shittier <laughs> than what we have now? It, it would take true effort to make it worse. Yeah. Like, like you would need you would need the most evil masterminds on the planet combined into one super villain right. to make it worse. Like you would just need like like okay, we need to we need to take this part of Carl Rove's brain, this part of Dick Cheney's brain. <laughs> And then we then we need to like 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 raise Hitler from the dead somehow, and, and let's get and then let let's meld them into to one evil Tron, and they'll design the new law enforcement, right. and it'll be even shittier than what we have now. It would take true effort to come up with something worse. So I think we're on the brink of a better tomorrow if we just uh, defund the police, disband the police, abolish the police, demilitarize the police, and then reinvent what it means to have law enforcement in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I had Lee camp on the show was talking about like, there's like traffic cops shouldn't have guns. Like they should just be like, there's no reason they pull you over because traffic laws are for all of our safety, you know? So they pull you over and go, Hey, you ran that red light. Uh, here's a ticket, go to traffic school. Cause we want you to be a better, safer driver. Cause that's safer for you and everybody else. And you're not afraid because this person doesn't have a gun. You're like, oh, shit, I got to go to traffic school and pay this fine. But you're also not worried that they're just going to fucking pull a piece on you. Right. And you just go and they show up and they're nice. And they're just like, hey, you know, <laughs> you ran that red light. It's dangerous for everybody. We just had a, an accident here last month where somebody got severely hurt. I don't want that to happen to you. Um, so really, please drive safe. We really want we really want, you know, like I, I, you would just react differently versus like. A cop showing up with of a badge course. and a gun. Well, I uh, I actually wrote like I actually wrote a thing because you know whenever I would tweet about this stuff, a lot of people would ask, and it's a fair question. Well, what would you do? So I actually wrote this like it's kind of like a bill, basically. As okay, this is how I would mm -hmm. have the concept of police in our life. This is what I would do, and I wrote it out like like first I would defund, demilitarize, and abolish everything, and and here's how I would rebuild it. And uh, I published the article, and I, I think a solid four, maybe five people read it. And um, <laughs> it's, uh, but I break down how I would have different kind of branches of officers, kind of like what you're talking about, where it's just like one branch would be traffic, and they wouldn't have guns, mm -hmm. and this is how they would do their thing. And and I said, you know, everyone would get like written warnings for various things, like if you're speeding, like okay, you're you know, please don't do that. That's, you know, you're, you're endangering other people. Here's a warning. And then if you do it again, you get a ticket like anything else. Cause if people are going to be, you know, put other people in sure. danger or, you know, refuse to fix a light or whatever, well, you know, you should get a ticket eventually after you get a warning. And if you don't heed the warning or whatever. Um, and then, you know, I have like another branch, which is just kind of like peace officers and they would like answer a noise complaint right, or something like that. And they also don't have guns. And also, you know, they're they're joined by, you know, mental health professionals and social workers when the situation warrants it. Like, say, there's a, mm -hmm. a nonviolent, non-threatening domestic dispute uh, that can't be resolved but between a couple or whatever else. Um, and then the third branch is I refer to them as combat officers. And they are, you know, a kind of in a situation where force may be 1000 percent unavoidable, uh, a live shooter right. or bank know, robber, robbery, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. You know, somewhat people are in immediate danger and those combat officers, the third branch, they um, never do the normal beat. You would never see them if you're just getting pulled over right. for a traffic violation. Or if you're you're just at a party that got too loud and they have to turn t tell you to turn it down, you would never see these officers. These officers train extensively, alongside mental health professionals and social workers and, mm -hmm. and de-escalation professionals, and they train extensively in uh, a, a specialized hand-to-hand -hand combat. A, um, they train extensively in gun safety. Um, and they would have guns, you know, especially if, if they're going to, you know, sure. if they go into a situation where there's a live shooter, of course, they would need to have a weapon in that case, uh, obviously. Um, so, you know, and to me, that just makes so much more sense. Like, I, I understand 
that sometimes there are extreme situations where we do need uh, armed law enforcement to yeah. solve it. So why not have the person who is just super, super prepared and ready to handle something like that? Yeah. And that's what their job is. That's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then I have all these other details. I won't, I won't go into all the nitty gritty, gritty, but it's like those, those branches of officers, you know, they have to pass physical exams mm -hmm. every year. They have to, you know, complete other coursework. They have uh, extensive mental health evaluations. All the officers do. There's, you know, a two year training period for every branch of officers. For combat officers, it's a four year training period. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, and you can be a combat officer for a certain amount of years and then maybe, you know, go down to traffic or something like that. You know, like, like maybe when you're in your prime, like when you're sure. in your mid 20s or something, you're a combat guy. And then you kind of, you know, switch over after and, a while. And it's, you know, I, I, I just think it's a better way to do things. I yeah. Don't know. <laughs> and, and look like, and there should be a public debate and discussion about the specifics of what you're talking about. Someone might have a right. plan that's like, you know, people bring up this, like, okay, if anyone in the combat unit or whatever has the SWAT team, whatever you want to call it, has PTSD, well, they get, they get treatment. Right now, cops with PTSD right. are told, man up, which right. exacerbates the situation. Now there's also like, you know, if there's domestic violence, uh, you know, against children or uh, significant others, obviously that needs to be dealt with. And like you also, maybe I would add like an investigative unit that deals with, you know, organized crime or stuff like right. that. Like uh, one of the guys I had on the show was a friend of mine was in the, was in the child crimes unit. And one of the things he did was investigate, uh, pedophiles. And, and that was, and most of his investigative work was like online. And so he helped. I, I, I bet he sleeps great at night. Oh man. Like, I bet he just yeah. feels great about the world. <laughs> yeah. I bet he's, he's got, I bet he feels great about humanity. That guy. Well, that, that this is, this is that you, you bring up a great point. Cause it's a thing I've talked to him personally, cause he's a longtime friend of mine. And I had him on the show last summer to discuss the Epstein case. One of the things he is doing now is he's now that he's retired is he works for a company that um, develops software to where investigators, because usually when you arrest a, a, you know, a pedophile, they have exploitation videos and photos on multiple devices and hard drives. And, and so an investigator has to look at all that and it's awful. And yeah. so they're developing technology to where, um, they only got to look at it maybe once and then, uh, an AI or software like software can, can say, Oh, this is the same file on multiple devices because he talked to you. He goes, Graham, the burnout rate was not, I mean, he was like going to lose it. He was having a hard time. His, his marriage wasn't going like it, it was hard. And he, he reached out and got help. And he's like right. a lot of cops investigators in that specific part department, um, wouldn't ask for help because cops have these type A personalities of suck it up and get it done. So he's yeah, a big, I, I can handle it. I'm fine. Exactly. I can handle it. Yeah. That's the same thing with the military. And, and there's a lot of vets. There's a lot of ex military in the police department. So that would be a big part of it is there has to be like PTSD counseling, EMDR, somatic therapy, all this stuff. And there needs to be these investigative things because there are awful sex trafficking rings and, and organized crime and stuff like that. But again, their specific, you know, he had to come up on patrol and deal with homeless people and all this other stuff that he never should have, cops shouldn't have to deal with. Like, um, so that's a big part of it too, is cops are just like, suck it up. We give them a badge and a gun, like a, a couple weeks of training and, <laughs> and there you go. Right. Good luck. Yeah, I mean, well, the other big thing that I call for specifically as well is a a civilian oversight yes. board. Yes, yes. Where it's like the way I propose it, and there's a number of different ways you can go about it, but like I would envision something like you have an elected board that, you know, the size of the board is, you know, just kind of dependent on the city. I mean, typically you, you would kind of have, you know, you would treat it around like kind of like a city council, like maybe every district has, you know, a representative on the board. And they make all these decisions. I mean, they, first of all, they, 
do all the screening for the hirees. They, you know, oversee all the departments. They make sure the resources are, are being used efficiently. They check in, um, you know, every, every month and, and they see, they evaluate how things are going. They screen applicants and they review misconduct. And, you know, and there's, I set rules aside for the board too, like the rules, you know, like the board, all the members are elected, but nobody could have priorly, you know, could have served in law enforcement in the past. You don't, you can't have that. Mm -hmm. and you, you can't have a spouse or, or a family member currently serving, you know, just to avoid potential conflicts of interest. And, um, you know, you can't accept any outside money from any group. And, uh, you know, if you violate that rule, you lose your spot immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I, uh, th there's just a number of ways. And, and, and I think like heavy civilian oversight and just a kind of reimagining of how the job works and what the right. job actually is, is 1000% necessary. Yeah. You know, and, and, and to, to address the investigation portion you mentioned uh, too, I mean, you can still have kind of like a similar feeding cycle, like what we have now, where it's like officers, you know, can move into investigation right. and detective work and stuff like that. Because, again, with this type of um, structure out the gates, you are going to get much higher quality officers. Yeah, well, let's also get rid of the uh, Supreme Court ruling from 2000 that allowed police departments to ban people with high IQs. Let's get rid yeah. of that. Um, yeah. uh, you know, and then there's so many things too, like that will also be fixed by the redistribution of money. So let's just use exam. Let's just use LAPD's budget for us for a second, right? It gets $3.1 billion. It is currently 54% of Los Angeles's operating budget. And I would, I would, I would suspect that most cities big or small have this sort of imbalance, right? Right. So let's just say let's just use round numbers. Let's say we just cut LAPD's budget in half and that billion five that we're taking away from them is going for homeless shelters. It's going for drug treatment, not to criminalize drug addicts, but to give them help. It's going for mental health. It's going for job training. It's, you know, it's, it's not, and I'm not talking about homeless shelters with cots. I'm talking about a, a an apartment. You get a studio or a one bedroom apartment, a two bedroom apartment. If you've got kids, you're given Food, clothing, job training, uh, drug treatment, mental health if need be. And if you, you know, you just like somebody is whatever, schizophrenic, bipolar, and they just can't function, well, then they'll be taken care of. You don't have to live on the street and put everyone at risk with that. And and so so that problem is then taken care of. All, so there's no dealing with homeless because we don't have any more homeless because the, the we're, we're not paying for armored vehicles and riot gear. We're paying for compassion and humanity. Um, so then there's that. So that's just taken that we don't have to deal with that. And then we're giving more money to, to funding schools. We're, we're finding out, I mean, in this last month, um, of all of the George Floyd protests, like, you know, white schools and, and predominantly white neighborhoods get 50% more funding for schools. So wait a minute now, let's even that out. So let's make the schools, yeah. the, the, the school, the inner city schools in the black and brown neighborhoods make those better. So now we're already... And oh, by the way, rather than more money for war, we're 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 giving free college to everybody. Like rather than a, the the one point five trillion dollar F thirty five that we don't need, there's student debt forgiveness. Everybody gets cut. So now all of these these societal ills that have been dumped in the lap of the police departments, half of them are gone. They're treated. They're done. With, like, you know. And yeah, the, well, and I would add to that. The one point five, you know, going on the model you you gave numerically, the one point five uh, billion that is kept for you know the existing, mm -hmm. you know, the reinvention of the police department, that doesn't go to tanks, no, or, or rubber bullets or tear gas. That goes to the type of training we're calling for. It. That mm -hmm. goes to the salaries of a civilian elected board. Yes, that goes to. Um, you know, col collaboration and cooperation between social workers and mental health professionals, because they're all on the same team and they're all hired by the city. Um, that goes yeah. to all towards all those things. Yeah. And to, to, instead of this extensive militarization, like what we have now. Yeah, exactly. That one five, the, those those like community outreach officers that we're talking about, you know, their training and their the mental health. So when they go deal with the homeless, they're showing up with there's 
EMTs and mental health people there and it's their training. It's not, it's not guns and body armor and everything else. The, the, the traffic officers we talked about earlier, part of it is their training, how to walk up to a car and go, Hey, <laughs> we really want you to be safe. This is for your safety, you know, plea for your own safety. like just that training, like all of that stuff that you're talking about. So then, and then th there's so much more, we would have a better city. We would have a better society. Like rather than seeing 10 cities at the foot of some massive high rise in Los, and this is on every, I mean, you can't go a mile in LA without seeing some new high rise for luxury apartments. I mean, there's some one bedrooms in Hollywood that are going for five grand a month. Like who has $60,000 a year just for rent? And so half of those buildings are empty. So, so there's just all of that, all of that, everything needs to get restructured. Like de developers can't buy their way into city councils anymore. Like all of yeah. it, man. Well, and you know, you can't go a mile without seeing a high rise. You also these days can't go a mile without seeing a tent city. I, yeah. I, I mean, people, I, I think a lot of people still think that, that, Oh, it's just, it's just skid row. It, like, like, no, it's every single neighborhood in Southern California. It's like, like we are at the brink. I mean, we are in mm -hmm. a very, 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 uh, desperate spot as a society. Yeah. I mean, Ron, I could, I am a 10 minute walk from, three different streets that are tent cities. Like, you know, all of the like goodwill type places have been closed during the pandemic. And so like, but now when I give clothes away, I just, I literally just drive down the street, unfortunately. And, and yeah, just, well, I, I was thinking, I, I think I can say that too. I think I am also about a 10 minute walk from about three tents. I'm like trying to picture in my head and, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely less than a 10 minute walk from at least one or two. Yeah. And, and I do the same thing. If I have like clothes to donate, I, I just kind of, I'll, I'll put a box in that area and just leave it. Yeah. I, I had an old, a, a pair of shoes, um, that I was getting rid of. I'm trying to get rid of stuff. And I just, I found a guy in sandals and I went, Hey man, do you need some shoes? And he goes, Oh yeah, fuck. I really needed those. I, I go, I figured I saw you in sandals. Thanks. And he was and now the tent cities, you're starting to see like dressers and stuff. Like they just moved out of an apartment. Yeah. Like, yeah, this we're you know, next week is July, which will be now month four of people probably not paying their rent. And maybe some people use their savings for April and May and maybe, but now like as we come into month four and again, we've all gotten $1,200 for three months, that's $400 a month. Like, and I just finally started to get, I got my first unemployment June 5th. I have, I just talked to a friend of mine who still hasn't, two friends of mine today, two different friends of mine who still haven't gotten unemployment. Yeah, it's. It's the end of June. Like, and you know, even the people who like, Oh, you should have six months of savings for a rainy day. Well, that six months is up in August. Well, and tell that to the people who are living paycheck to paycheck. Right. Working two or three jobs. Like, like, oh, yeah, you should have six. You don't have that? Well, that's your fault. Like, really? Because living wages aren't an right. issue at all in this country. I know. So that's the thing. So even if you're lucky enough to have six months of savings, those people are going to be out of money in a couple of months. So then everyone else living pay to pay they they've been out of money. Yeah. They're out of money in April. I mean, like, and they didn't pay our rents. They didn't. <laughs> they no, didn't. I mean, they, they had that eviction moratorium for like a month and that was it. <laughs> it's like, it's like, Hey, they can't evict you. Not yet. Anyway, later they'll be able to evict you but, <laughs> but for a little bit. They can't evict you because we care. We care. They can't evict you for like a little bit. Then we they really care. Handle. Yeah, we care. Have fun. Good luck. So, Ron, tell everybody about our uh, our Zoom show Saturday, the 27th of June. It's going to be amazing. We're, we're doing a, a Zoom show tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, to obtain that link, Venmo Graham 
$5. And his Venmo is just Graham Dash Elwood. All of the proceeds are going to be donated to the local chapter of Black Lives Matter. That's Black Lives, well, for us, that's Black Lives Matter LA. That's our local chapter. So we are going to donate all the proceeds uh, to that local chapter. If you don't do Venmo, uh, you know, just email one of us. We'll figure something out. Um, but uh, yeah, it's all for charity and for to just have a fun night and have a fun show. And, uh, you know, these Zoom shows, of course, it's not quite the same as being at a nightclub. And it, it really hurts yeah. both of our hearts immensely to not be able to tour right now. And, and we miss it dearly, um, you know, especially as stand-ups. It's, it's, it's so hard. But it's still a lot of fun. And, and it still has that live show atmosphere. We, we, we tell our jokes and we hear your laughter coming back at us through the speakers. And it, uh, you know, it helps make everybody feel a little less alone and, and a little bit part of something. And it's... Um, you know, it, it's definitely helped me maintain my sanity through all this. So I hope you'll join us tomorrow night. It's going to be a lot of fun. Like, share, and subscribe. Hit the bell notification button and the subscribe button, even if you've done it before because they're unsubscribing, many of you, every day. Watch the ads all the way through. If you click skip ad, I don't get paid. Also, support us at patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood. Rockfin.com is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. All my videos are on Rockfin ad free. Thanks for watching.